Hello, um, my name is Carol Palmer. I'm the CBRL director. I'm in Amman and welcome to this uh, CBRL webinar, The Battle for Home Inside Syria, with our two speakers for today, uh, Zahed Tajuddin and uh, Diana Dark, um, who are going to be giving two presentations, uh, one after the other, um, and I'll give a short introduction to them uh, shortly. But first of all, I would like to say something just about CBRL. I'm aware that we have many people joining us from all around the world who may not be familiar with us. So just to say welcome and thank you very much indeed um, uh, for joining us in this CBRL webinar. Um, CBRL is an independent UK research charity and membership organization that actually has its origins in the region for approximately a hundred years, but that's another story. And we exist to conduct support and promote, especially humanities and social sciences research on the Levant, or as some people would say, Levantine Middle East. I'm aware people are still joining us, so I'm just going to just cut in and say my name's Carol Palmer, I'm CBRL Director. I'm just giving some broad introduction at the moment about CBRL. Um, so we're a charity, um, we're part of the British Academy's eight international research institutes, sometimes also called BIRI, and uh, we receive a, a, a grant to, to continue our operations via the British Academy. But we are always grateful to our members and friends all around the world whose donations also enable us to continue and develop and expand our work and do additional research projects. Um, we have offices in London at the British Academy and then two institutes in the region one in East Jerusalem and the second in Amman, where I am based. And um, our institutes uh, serve as hubs for uh, scholarly community and interested uh, members. Um, we have libraries, we run events uh, that are normally live and in person. Uh, we run events across all our institutes in London, um, in London, Amman and Jerusalem. Uh, please do check out our website to find out more about us. We hope that you will enjoy today's webinar and um, will join us for future events as well. Uh, join our mailing list, um, look at the CBRL UK website, it's CBRL UK organised here. But I think I will move on quite quickly now to introduce uh, today's speakers. We have two talks, two perspectives from homes inside Syria. Um, archaeologist, conservator and sculptor Zahed Tajuddin um, was born in Aleppo. He has uh, degrees in uh, chemistry, fine art and an MA in archaeology and a PhD in archaeological science and sculptural, um, and sculptural art. Since 2006, he's been an honorary researcher at UCL's Institute of Archaeology. He has a special interest in history, ancient arts, architecture, and the Middle East and the Mediterranean basin. He's widely published on arts and ancient material science and does regular interviews with the BBC, Discovery Channel, and a number of other outlets. His work is exhibited internationally um, notably at the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Brazilian Parliament and Manchester Museum. Because our speakers are going to speak one after each other, I'm going to also introduce Diana Dark as well, who is an author and Syria expert with degrees in Arabic from Oxford and Islamic art and architecture from SOAS. Um, she has a very a varied career working for government and commercial sectors and lived in the Middle East and Turkey for more than 30 years. And she's a fully independent uh, commentator on, on the Middle East. 
um, and does numerous interviews again for uh, media, including BBC Radio, TV, PBS America. And she's also a prolific author. And uh, her talk today is based on her book, My House in Damascus, um, an inside view of the Syria crisis, um, which is now in its third edition and is currently on special offer <laughs> for 30% reduced. Um, I think I will stop there and hand over to our speakers. We can, I should say that uh, those of you who are joining us on a Zoom using the Q&A can ask questions during the, during the talk. Those questions will be answered at the end, not during the talk, um, but we hope to have some good time for discussion at the end too. So we're going to start with uh, Zahid talking about his house in Aleppo. Thank you. Um, so hello everybody. I'm uh, Zahid Tajuddin and uh, thank you for the introductions and inviting me to be here at this uh, venue and share my story with you. I'm going to, you know, share my PPT to start so we can see what's going on and here we are i'm going to start with this slide which is a a, a print from the book uh, uh, national Hero, which was created by the two brothers bernard russell uh, in in 18th century so as you see aleppo at that time was a, a very uh, wealthy city and you can see like you know people sitting enjoying drinking coffee smoking shisha uh enjoying the the the, the setup that they created um i'm going to sorry let's see i'm going to start here with the question about house home a difference between that so what's his house a house is a shell uh, we all like you know who are who are we to start i mean this question is um, a bit complicated but i would i would say we as a conscious as a spirit live in our first house with our body our flesh but then uh, we need to keep it healthy and clean take care of it our first house the second layer will be our dressing code, clothing, style. Of course, it has function. It protects us from cold or heat or, again, show us our status or whatever we would like to present. And then of that, the next home, uh, next house will be our room, our shelter, our flat, our house, and that's the city. So it's multi-layers and we go to the city, it has a certain culture, identity, traditions, that we, it becomes part of this bigger house. This is now becoming home, you know, then in the country, and then the identity. Of course, live in the 21st century where this becomes even more stronger, especially that we travel, we are moved from one place to another, and the, the word home, especially for someone like me who I, Yes, I was born in Syria, but I lived in Europe more than I lived in Syria. I left Syria in my early 20s, but then uh, I never stopped going back to Syria. Every, day, every year I went there at least two, three times, either for work or keeping contact with my family. Now, I'm um, moving to Aleppo, which is my hometown. Uh, Aleppo, as you probably know, this picture is from 2017, where you can see the scars of war, evidence on the citadel that meant the design of Aleppo. Uh, as you see here on the map, Aleppo itself within the, within the uh, world, evil city itself, it was declared and recognized by UNESCO in 1978 to be a world heritage site and then was protected and um, uh, kind of uh, protected and conserved to, to, to stay in that, uh, uh, stay as, as it is, as an evidence of certain 
type of arch uh, architecture and lifestyle. Now, sadly, the situation in Syria in 2011 changed. We have the revolution started, the Arab Springs that soon started in Syria. So what started as demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations, Dara and Homs, demanding reform, anti-corruption, uh, justice, was heavy handed by the regime and the situation started going into another direction. Armed forces, other uh, agency got involved. We have uh, international and regional power were involved and became a proxy war, which is still going on till now. Sadly, this, of course, left big part of Syria he heavily damaged. And Aleppo is one of the most damaged cities uh, recognized now since the Second World War. And uh, it's very sad, actually, to see it. But that's what happens. Just to kind of like, you know, give you a little background on Aleppo. Aleppo, although the citadel, what we see now dominating the skyline of Aleppo, that citadel, the mount itself is an archaeological site and it's uh, it house a temple from 3000 BC. So this is kind of like, you know, Bronze Age, Bronze Age time, although excavation proved that Syria and Aleppo itself uh, was inhabited since the eighth millennia. So it's one of the still oldest inhabited city in the world and it's still going on. So it's layers and layers of multicultures and archaeology. Now those, uh, Photos is an excavation from the citadel, of course, was damaged in the war. Uh, the, the mission that they were excavating, they tried quickly to hide it and put shelters on top of it. But during the war and the different bombings, it was uh, shelters damaged. Luckily, the, the panels themselves were not badly damaged. Just give a few examples of kind of iconic uh, monument in Aleppo, which is the Umayyad Mosque, one of them that was heavily damaged. As you see here, uh, the minaret lost, big fire uh, affected uh, one whole wing of the mosque and it was uh, the, the really in a bad situation. The, the library as well was burned down. So that is a, a tragedy in its own. Now the other big loss is the Grand Bazaar, which is the longest bazaar in the world. It's miles and miles of covered bazaar, which is not only uh, uh, it's, as a, it's a monument, it's a living organ, it's an economy. Aleppo, it's a, a, the economical capital of Syria. And this little bazaar uh, shops, they are really controlling what's going on in Syria's economy. And the loss of that bazaar and of the people who run that place, it's a major loss for, for, the, for the city and the country. I'm going now to move to our uh, theme, which is home. I will just try to introduce you to start with the, uh, the term Bet Arabi, which is, means uh, Arabic house. That's the tradition which has evolved over hundred, if not thousand of years. But the shape, which is became very characteristic, which is you see it everywhere in Aleppo, it's, it's what we see here in this maquette. So uh, you, it's it's like a, it's a bubble. It's a, it's a little shell, protects you from the outside, and then you, you have like a courtyard in the middle that shelters you from the sun during the day, uh, so you can move from the east to the west, it depends on the, the, the time of the day, and have shadows, have warmth in the winter, and cooler areas in the summer, and so on. Of course, you have like, you know, the, we'll talk later about the qa'a or the reception hall, which is have like a big dome. Sometimes the wealthy houses would have a, a, a bath within. Now, this little features, they are early air conditionings. So it's an, an opening in the roof that, 
directed to the west, whereas the the sea wind uh, blow in that direction from that direction, and uh, uh, that would uh, the fresh air down to the rooms, and usually would have even water, so it would be cooled while it's spread in the rooms. So it's very sophisticated, very elaborate. Remember like Aleppo in medieval Aleppo is one, one of the wealthiest city in the world. Uh, Shakespeare mentioned it three times in his books. It was like, you know, next to Constantinople, the capital of the, of, of course, the Ottoman Empire. And uh, the Aleppo positions gave her huge status and wealth. Uh, became like you know the hub point for all the caravanserais on the Silk Road uh, from between Europe and all the way to China and India. So just from outside this house houses uh, they really don't see anything you just see a, a little gate um, that opens up into the courtyard and massive wells probably or modest house. So from the outside, and this is something traditional about, again, Islamic or Arabic, they don't like to show wells for envy, for uh, people not to, uh, you know, the showing wealth wasn't uh, uh, encouraged. Uh, and that's evidence in the houses, the way they build them. So you can really has no difference uh, between wealthy house or poor house on the street. So this little alleyways, they have, uh, could be on one side, a thousand meter square house, on the next to it, one which is only a hundred square meter house. So, which is very beautiful and modest way of presenting their life. Now you enter and then the whole house, that little kind of corridor opens to a courtyard open to the sky usually have jasmine tree honeysuckle and of course uh, citrus trees like um, uh, orange or, or lemon trees uh, you will have like you know the, the uh, kind of like a pool with a fountain you, the water is always soothing the atmosphere and give you a very pleasant and beautiful uh, uh, air in that court, surrounded by rooms. Uh, traditionally, they all rooms and the interaction always through the, court, the courtyard. So there's no connection between the rooms, very rarely between the rooms bet themselves. But every time you want to room from one room to another, you go to the courtyard. So the courtyard is the interaction zone. There is no kitchen, only a little kitchen for cooking. But then people cook and then take with the beautiful brass trays, uh, into the courtyard, so uh, on, on little table they eat out in the courtyard, and the liwan, which is that uh, kind of like void in the courtyard, which is facing north, to protect people all day long from the heat of the sun. Or you take like you know the food into the rooms if it's winter. So there is no um, uh, kind of like a kitchen as we know in later modern architecture. The same with public, uh, with, with the bath, uh, bathrooms. We have toilets, but uh, bathrooms, they usually in the modest houses are very small or they don't even exist. And you see in every street corner, a public bath where people want and their uh, uh, washing and, uh, uh, and, and bath. So the, move inside so that is usually in all kind of wealthy houses you will have so-called the uh, or the reception hall and this is like you know perfect example of one from aleppo where you see the the owner displaying completely the wealth with with the furniture with the uh, mosaic that's made of uh, stones and marbles, and then you have the walls all decorated with so-called ajami, which is wooden panels made of walnuts, rose, and then decorated with gesso, very colorful, very beautiful, with poems and drawings showing, reflecting the lifestyle uh, of, uh, of the Aleppian at the time. And you can even see a little fountain inside with small streams of water that really very pleasant always the sound of water is very soothing and very um, uh, relaxing 
they, they played music in those uh, rooms and it was the, the, where they received their hosts and their guests and of course enjoyed the lifestyle. I will move to my family now. Uh, this is my grandmother from 1939 and my father as a little boy. He was here three years old. Um, they lived in a, my, my grandmother, Amina Hariri, she's a daughter of a very wealthy merchant that he uh, was working with pistachio uh, trade. And they lived in a house that massive, that's later when they left it, it became a school. And this is the story of all the houses. Uh, especially the larger one, they became other schools or factories or workshops. Uh, now, of course, I did not grow up in, in such a house. By, by the time I grew up, even my grandmother, they moved in 1920s, sorry, in 1940s to a modern flat. So you see there is a shift in around 1920s, 1930s with the, with, the, with the French mandate in Syria and the arrival of modernity we have a new architecture uh, dominating Aleppo. So outside the walls, Aleppo was expanding in all directions, building blocks of flats in Italian and French style. So that is, was trendy, fashionable. So all these families, they start from the uh, old traditional houses within the walls into those flats, including my grandparents and then my, my father. So that, I mean, I remember asking my grandmother because I always like, you know, admire those houses. Why you left those houses? And she said, oh, it's a, a lot huge. You get into in and out in the cold and the rain. So it's not practical. And then they used to live uh, there in groups. So she was living there with her sister-in-law and like, you know, probably a mother and father. Uh, and if the family would have like the one room, uh, and then the others have another room and the interaction happens in the courtyard. So it wasn't, it was a bit of community, small community in each houses, uh, each of these houses. Uh, so they did not like it and they had enough of that living and they were really happy with the modern flats that then by the French. Uh, so they moved out of that house and the house became a school. So this is the story of those houses that became uh, workshops and schools and um, little factories and so on. Now, I, I, I say I left Syria in the 90s and then I skipped going. I developed more love to archaeology, history, architecture, and um, it becomes my, it became my dream to own one of those houses and show that these houses can be brought back to 20, brought, brought to 21st century and modernized to suit our uh, way of living at the moment. So it was, I was on a mission, it took me more than 10 years scanning and going and like looking for a house that's a suitable budget wise for me to buy and fits my vision on bringing the house uh, to kind of like a, a, a modern uh, lifestyle. So yes, in 2004, I found this house and I bought it. And it starts like, you know, my, my, my passion with this uh, uh, venture. Uh, house itself, it has, it's a kind of like a U-shape with a courtyard in the middle. So you have one facade from the late Mamluk time and you get like, you know, the, uh, the other sides in the 17th century, 18th century, and then a, a new addition was added uh, uh, to rooms up in early 20th century. So it's multi-layers and it, it's, it's just like, you know, fit the whole, you know, I have, I have this, this idea that artifacts, architecture, they have biography. So this house at some point in, in the 16th century was built. Definitely we can see it was part of like a bigger house and then later was divided, section added, other sections demolished and so on. So the biography, it goes on and the house evolves. 
and it's become like really curious to see the size of stone they use, the way they use the windows, different from that side, and uh, and that's uh, made me research all this um, different styles and pinpoint the time when it's happened. So it's really it's like uh, uh, unrevealing, unearthing all this information. So it's a pleasure to be just in the courtyard and explore and mm. feel the history and feel that power come from the past in, a, in real estate uh, and it needed a lot of work so I embarked on a mission with the help of a friend of mine, an architect um, I think he would be between us here somewhere, Jamal Jaber uh, and he, we, we did a lot of research to bring this house back to life and modernize it. So basically we dismantle it completely, treating the wood, the like uh, 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 joist wood panels that they were, uh, joist that they were rotten, we treat them, put them back, uh, replace the, the, the damaged wood, all the plaster, the modern plaster was removed. We used back again the lime traditional plaster and so on. So it was a lot of details. And of course, to make it modern, we opened it uh, from inside. So you can access the whole uh, house, uh, the, 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 all the different rooms within the house from room into the other. So unlike the, the, the old style. And of course, we added a kitchen and we added a bathroom and we restored the cellar. It took four years, four long years, uh, as all the time, sometimes difficult, sometimes exciting, but it was a beautiful result to her house at the end. And during the journey, we learned a lot. Uh, and I was very pleased with the result. He who was against the whole idea, he was really against the idea of me buying an old house and restore it. He couldn't see why I'm doing this. And uh, uh, at the end, it became his paradise. So even when I'm traveling, he would be there every day, you know, next to the fountain with his book and uh, uh, brought back his childhood memory. And I was very pleased to give him that little present that kept him happy for years. We learned a lot from that process you know, paintings, woodwork, very, and we try to research all the traditional way and seek craftsmen that they were able to uh, do all this complicated work. I mean, I look at here at the stairs, we put the stairs in to serve the house from within. So this is carved from one piece of stone, uh, inserted into the walls. It's real kind of very elegant, very slim. So kind of like the uh, challenging gravity with, with that conversation. Uh, every little details shows years of research and evolution of uh, architecture and crafts and workmanship. So it was very beautiful. So we had like a little bathroom and again, a little dome. We, we borrowed that from the bath uh, houses. Uh, and then it was the major work which is creating a ceiling, a traditional one made of ajami. So I again researched uh, uh, different styles, not only in Aleppo, in Damascus and in Cairo, try to fuse things together since I'm adding something new, uh, replacing what's existed at some point uh, in the house. But I wanted to have like, you know, something contemporary with the spirit of the, the period uh, you know, of the house. So after a long research, we commissioned amazing craftsmen in Damascus to uh, construct this uh, ceiling, very beautifully painted and decorated. And the house became a little paradise, really, a little shell uh, that we enjoyed it. Here's my two sons in the courtyard, they used to call it our castle and um, it brought us all a lot of pleasure, me and my wider family. It 
2011, the story changed. It's uh, the revolution, as we said, in 2011, by 2013, reached Aleppo. Aleppo was uh, controlled almost 60% by the rest. Uh, different fractions, some of them radical, really uh, caused a lot of troubles to uh, kind of structure to, the, you know, the, 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 I'm not going to go too much into politics, but uh, the Islamic State was controlled Aleppo for some times, and that was really till the Free Syrian Army recognized their role and kicked them out of the city. But Aleppo suffered a lot in that time. And for me, since 2010, I couldn't go anymore because of the situation in Syria. My father kept going there to protect the house, and it was really dangerous trips. In one of those trips, he was a trap between a crossfire, and he was lying on the floor for a couple of hours. He became deaf since then. So it was real, really heavy tragedy, and I was like, you know, begging him not to go anymore and forget the house. The house had its own uh, kind of like, you know, place in history, and you cannot protect it. It can't protect itself. And I just kept following the news and YouTubes and video posts from people on the internet, seeing this is the square next to my house, bullets everywhere, fire. This is my street. You can see fire on one side, on the other side, damage to the walls and houses. I didn't house. So they were, uh, for a period of time, for five years, we had no news. Aleppo was separate, divided in two cities, controlled by other oppositions or the government, and we had no information. Things start coming down a little bit. In 2015, I went back to court after five years. And at that time, it was really dangerous time and really heavy, but I went there to kind of try to get my parents out. That was my, my goal. And then I uh, managed to sneak. This is the, the, tower, uh, the municipality tower in Aleppo. It's the, the highest building in Aleppo. And it is right on the borderline between oppositions and government. So this street, I, I, I managed to sneak into the 18th floor of that tower. So basically here, which is, was all, all the windows shattered. It was always targeted by the oppositions and snipers were post, posted on everywhere, on every window, especially at highest. So, so if you look carefully at those roads, there's nothing here, not even cats. Cats would, crossing the roads would be at targeted by snipers. Anyway, I managed to sneak there, take one of my sculptures and as a witness, and I uh, took these pictures and ran away. Uh, I knew that my house is somewhere there in the old city, but I had no access, no news, nothing about it. That was 2015. There's a new player arrived in 2000, late 2015, the Russian, with their mighty, you know, air forces and arsenal and they start with supporting the government on uh, you know advancing in Syria and reclaiming territories. And the siege of Aleppo started in 2016 in the autumn within three months after heavy heavy bombardment day and night to the opposition sites which include the old city my house within, and this is the result. It's real mayhem. And um, this photo I took myself at end of December 2016, declared Aleppo as liberated, and they managed to, uh, the, the, the opposition withdraw. I won't say there was any kind of battles, real battles between them and the, the government forces, but some deal was there again with the big powers and they withdraw from Aleppo for a certain price and Aleppo was left in ruins. So I managed to go there straight into the old city and try to see what's going on there. All the news I knew about my house that it, was, it became a medical center, little hospital, field hospital, 
which is really uh, a, a, a big worry for me at the time because the, the first things the Russian did uh, and the, the, the government um, air forces were bombing every single hospital and my house wasn't an exception of course. So this is December 2016, my first pictures going to my house. This is my old cities, my old streets in ruins reaching my house that was the same. It was hit by an air raid of a Sukhoi airplane, Russian. Now we know all the details, I'll come to that later quickly. The house was uh, luckily not affected. The missile, the missile hit only part of it. And then of course, next to it, it just complete ruins. So all the houses next to my house are in, in real. Uh, in the house, of course, you see the evidence down in the cellars. They have 13 beds, and then there is a echographic, a dental praxis, 18 rooms in the courtyard, uh, and medicines and ev everywhere in the house scattered. Damage, of course, the house was till December, November uh, 2016, was still. Uh, as a medical center, as we find out later, and it was in a very good condition, apart from the hit by the uh, air raid, but the, it was still a uh, function at the medical center. And the soon, the, the, I would say the militia, the troops, the government troops moved in, they looted the house, they turned it upside down, taking every single piece of brass, pulling electric wires out of the walls, and then throwing anything they don't want. I recognized that I am sitting on a kind of like a, a little mount of my artifact, my history, my photos, passports, my certificates, my graduation certificates, all that. So, you know, I've got, it was a few weeks, I became an archaeologist of my own history try to recover documents, books, and artifacts from my life. And I was pressed, but I just needed to look out of the window to see what happens to the houses next to me. They were flattened. So I was, in a way, lucky. Or the house was lucky. We know later, we, with, the, with work with the BBT here, uh, they, they traced the man who ran the house as a hospital. And I was saying, when I was in the house, I would say, if those walls could talk and tell us what's happened in those five years, I don't want to say like, you know, in the last centuries or so, but just what's happened in those years. And then we managed to find the man who was there for five years. And he was telling us he was treating people every day, 30, 40 injured would come with sharp nails, sniper shots. And then he would invite orphans and have parties, uh, food supplied. It made me really happy that house played a role in, in that really critical time and entertained and it brought some smile to children faces. The question was, what should I do? Now, it's not about the house, it's about the city. The city, it's in big mess. Yes, I can maybe restore the house, which is I started. I don't know why, because yes, I can live in the house, I can restore it, but it's not only the house. My city is no longer the same. The community is not the same. The culture is different. So probably in my lifetime, I won't see Aleppo the way it was. It won't be restored to what it was culturally. Anyway, my, my duty to that house, that it is four or five hundred years old, much older than me. So I did not own the house. The house owned me. I'm only facilitator. Yes, I brought it back to life once. I decided to do that again, although I'm not living in it. I did. I within. I employed uh, craftsmen, found them, and they start doing the work, restoring all the damage. And the house was lit up again. We sealed the windows to the outside because looters were still operating. And 
a neighbor of mine who lost his house completely, his family now living in the house happily taking care of it and he's taking care of them. My father was very happy with the stick and he came back to the house and he was very happy to see it alive again. So this is my story. I want to end up with a, this is the street of Aleppo about last year. So they are start clearing rubbles. The city is still hurt, still scarred. They cleared the rubbles, they're keeping the stones. Hopefully sometime it will be rebuilt. And Aleppo have seen many disasters, many turmoils and managed to live at all. So hopefully there will be life again. And our role is to celebrate, restore, and enjoy beauty and bring it back regardless. I would say thank you. I will pass to Diana and hope you will enjoy. Thank you. Diana, over to you. Okay. Just, I was just explaining how the five families who lost their homes in the suburbs of Damascus, because 45% of the housing of Syria has actually been destroyed, um, according to the World Bank. So that gives you some scale of the number of people who have lost their homes. I mean, half the population of Syria has been displaced either internally or externally. I mean, the figures are sort of beyond comprehension and 80% of the population is, is below the poverty line. So these are mind boggling um, statistics. But um, the, the, uh, so, so the five families shared, shared the space in my house, um, which was difficult for them, as I was explaining, with the kitchen, um, uh, you know, one kitchen, two bathrooms. But, but they, they, they realized they were the lucky ones. And this all worked fine for about three years until um, my lawyer realized that I was starting to write um, anti-Assad things in the British press. And he thought, aha, she's never coming back. I can steal the house from her. So in cahoots with the previous owner, he put a case through the courts to say that I'd sold the house back to him voluntarily. And that's what would have happened if I hadn't uh, challenged the system. And incidentally, in order to get my, my five family um, out of the house, what he did was he wrote a report to the security authorities, to the Mahabharat, saying that uh, I was a British terrorist and that I had links with armed groups in the Ghouta, which was a, a known rebellious, uh, you know, the eastern part of Damascus. So on the strength of that, soldiers came to the house and arrested all my friends and put them in prison, including the children, and some of them were tortured. And this is the situation I was presented with um, back in um, uh, back in the UK. So everybody said to me, look, it's just a house, you know, you've got to forget about it. Um, you've just got to leave it. But as, as Zah had explained, it, it's not just a house. You know, for me, if I had just let that house go, it would have been like giving up on Syria and just admitting that there was nothing I could do. So I did, I was determined to go back and fight for the house in whatever way I could without any notion of how I could possibly succeed. But uh, I managed, uh, against all the odds, to get a, a visa to go back via the French, uh, via, via the Syrian embassy in Paris, and they, they took three months to think about it, but they finally gave me a visa to go back for 15 days and to try to get the house back. And uh, this, <laughs> those 15 days, I can honestly say, were the most exciting time of my life because it was very dangerous by then. This, this was late 2014. Um, I mean, Damascus was, I mean, it had about two hours of electricity a day. It was, it looked as if everything was about to collapse. And, uh, but astonishingly, again, with the help of my Syrian friends and neighbors, I was able to, uh, to get the house back. And we did that by challenging the system, by simply physically being there. I, I appointed a new lawyer. And he said, look, you've just got to get inside the house and stay there, <laughs> as if that was going to be simple. But uh, we managed it somehow to get in um, because they were so sure I wasn't coming back that they never even changed the locks. So I, uh, the first time I was able to literally just walk in and uh, uh, call a locksmith and get the locks changed, thinking, wow, well, that was easy, wasn't it? But of course, in fact, that was just the beginning. 
because as soon as they heard I was back, what happened was that um, soldiers were sent to the house again. And this was the beginning of the door being broken down. I would have shown you photos of all of this, of the smashed in door. <laughs> five times, five changes of lock we had. Um, but still, I didn't run away. And they were so astonished, really, that I wasn't running away, that they thought, what's going on here? You know, there must be somebody really powerful behind her. What, what uh, you know, we better perhaps be a bit careful. And of course, I was very much um, uh, playing onto that. Um, and so, uh, uh, against all the odds, with the help of uh, my Syrian friends, I was able to uh, to get to get back to get back the house. And I would have shown you um, the pictures of the uh, the bad lawyer, the the fake general, the baby that was living in the house, the illegitimate uh, child, <laughs> and um, and how we. Um, no, I haven't stopped screen sharing. <laughs> no. I don't know what's happening here, whether it's now allowing me to um, to do something or not. It's, uh, I don't know whether you can yes. see the screen still. Yes. Yes. Okay, well look, in that case, I'm gonna very, very quickly run through the pictures. I don't know, in the hope that you've been able to see, this is the tiny bit of damage that was sustained to the mosaics in, in the Amalek Mosque. And this was repaired within weeks very quickly by cross and This is the damage in the, in the suburbs of Damascus where my friends lost their Families moved into my house. These are some of the children, four, four different families. These children who ended up very close. Um, this is the house when I first bought it in 2005. Now, it looks like that. Um, and that's not because of the war. This, this was just a very neglected house. And you have to remember that even before the war, um, these houses were out of fashion, as Zah had explained, and, and nobody really wanted them. People wanted nice modern flats in the suburbs, so they were the ones, ironically, who got destroyed. Um, and, you know, old houses like mine in, in, the, in the old city were, have been spared throughout the war. So this is now 2005, where I'm starting to, the restoration process of the house. I'm virtually camping there. Um, we, we, like, like with Zahid, we strip everything back, we see the mud brick walls, this wonderful mud brick, it's like an eco house that, you know, you don't need air conditioning um, in houses like this, you've got six meter high ceilings. This is the electrician in the middle of the, um, the uh, restoration and we're, 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 um, we're about to have one of our many tea breaks, he's bringing the kettle over there with all the glasses along the rim of the, uh, of the fountain. This is the Ajami room that I have, a beautiful fabulous room, hand painted. It's like a vision of paradise itself. When you sit in there, you feel as if you're embraced by some heavenly garden. And then this is the, the secret ceiling, as I describe it, which is tucked away. Even the previous owner didn't know it was there. These are the original water pipes that we found feeding into the house, because all these incredible courtyard houses actually had running water for, for centuries. You know, they were so advanced. So we decided to keep these. Um, this is uh, one of the walls after, after the restoration, and I decided not to do a sort of artificially perfect restoration. So if you can see the hole there to the left of the door, I decided that kind of thing is like a scar, or keep that kind of thing, rather than artificially trying to smooth it over. Because that, if you like, again, symbolically, is the sort of scar, one of the many scars that Syria is going to bear from this conflict. And the house has already come through, you know, earthquakes, wars, uh, fires, invasions in the past and it bears the scars of all of this. This is why these houses are so multi-layered as I was explaining. So um, you know you see these layers in everything. So this is what we ended up with after the after the, um, the three years of restoration. Everything restored and as with Syria itself the only um, the only new things we had to put into this house was was the wiring, the plumbing, and the drainage. So as with Syria, you know, the, it's the infrastructure, all that corrupt infrastructure is what has to be ripped out so that the, the, uh, the functioning of the, the, the country can be what it should be. Again, the house is a kind of microcosm of the city. This is the view from the roof. So unlike um, 
with Aleppo, you know, you, everything is pretty much that, that view is the same now. The house was then used in, in one of the Ramadan soaps, the very famous uh, Bab al Hara. Um, it, it was used as a film set, quite amusingly, really. That, um, so you've got people dressed up like some costume drama, but using their mobile phones and drinking from plastic water bottles. This is one of the un, unwanted inhabitants of the house, the snake. Um, you get quite a lot of that sort of thing in, in, in the old courtyard houses. This was an inhabitant who we did want, my tortoise called uh, Zulfikar. Who, who may or may not have survived the chemical attack in 2013 in the Ruta, we, we will never know. But this is what, where the soldiers kicked in the, the, the door back in 2014. I wrote a report saying I was a terrorist and um, uh, you know the house, everybody in the house was arrested and put in prison as a result of that. But I was able to go back and um, you know, be able to uh, challenge them essentially and in the end, we, we, this is the mistress of the bad lawyer. He, the bad lawyer is standing on the right there. The new lawyer is in the middle, uh, signing, witnessing her signing away her rights to be in the house because uh, he'd, he'd, he'd done her a, co a counterfeit um, you know, legal contract to be there. So I'm giving her a small sum of money so that she can go and rent somewhere else for, for, for a month. And then, of course, because we've done the deal, suddenly we're best friends again. When I, believe me, I made that woman's life hell for the 15 days that I was in the house with her. But by the end, she said, I'm so glad to be leaving this house because you've, you've, you've made my life so miserable. I, I, I want to leave now. So I got, so we were all suddenly best friends. That's their illegitimate child who was born in the house. Um, and then after they'd gone, um, I was able to get a locksmith friend to put um, new doors on and this was all just within the 15 day visa period that I had got and it was it was quite a time I can tell you and but again you know one of the strange things as I said I couldn't have done it without my Syrian friends I mean they, they totally backed me up they, 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 they helped me guard the door they did everything um, to help me because they knew that I was trying to save this house but, but that it wasn't just a house it was it was one we were writing one tiny little injustice in Syria um, and but one of the things that had upset me was that the vine that had grown right up onto the roof terrace, um, I thought was dead. But um, the friend who's now living in the house, he sent me this photo of the little, the vine putting out little shoots. And um, uh, and then the following year, it's growing up to the roof. And then finally, it, it started to produce grapes again, just, just like it always had. And so that's uh, fi finally managed to get to the end of the pictures. And so thank you for bearing with me on all of that. But the, the message is essentially the same as Zahid's, that, uh, you know, each of us have fought for our, um, our particular houses, but it, it hasn't just been a house. That's, that's the point, you know. With something like this, it, it kind of becomes part of you and you can't just give up on it because it is like giving up on everything to do with Syria. So... And, and that um, is something that uh, certainly my friends and neighbours have very much appreciated. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's not over, but I, I firmly believe that things will get better in future. I mean, the COVID-19 um, COVID coronavirus in, in Syria is, is of course knocking the economy absolutely for six at the moment because they've had lockdown for, for quite um, well, well over a month now, starting to ease. But um, Officially, there are hardly any deaths. There are only four deaths all the way across the country. Nobody believes the figures, but, you know, it, it, it is an extraordinary thing. But economically, uh, things are very, very uh, desperate. And, um, you know, the Syrian pound has lost 97% uh, of its pre-war value. I mean, people can barely afford to buy the basics. And, of course, during Ramadan now, the lockdown has meant that people can't gather for the usual iftar, and it's been a, a, a Ramadan like like no other. But um, you know, like Zahid, I will continue to to do my best to to fight for a better future for Syria, and I'm I'm quite sure we can get there if everybody um, just does a little bit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, to both our <laughs> speakers. Um, yes, uh, lives within houses, especially old houses. I feel uh, very privileged myself that I was able to, um, before 2011, spend some time in Syria myself, both in Aleppo 
and uh, and in Damascus. I haven't been able to go back myself since 2011. So it's wonderful to see the houses, even and very sad too to see the destruction, especially in in Aleppo. Um, we have some questions, um, and I would just like to. Um, you're talking very much about these not only being uh, buildings, but as being as being homes in your um, excavations, if you like, in your reconstructions. Uh, did both of you find out about the families who lived there? Did you find out more about uh, who these houses belonged to, if they had belonged to the same family or they had had changed changed hands in the time before you came to look at them? Um, I can maybe answer that quickly. I mean, in my case, uh, I could trace only a couple of generations in my uh, the house I bought. Uh, as I said, the traditional old families, they left about a century ago, and then more poorer family uh, lived there. Mainly, they were migrant, migrant from the outskirts of Aleppo. So in my case, wasn't, I, don't, I don't have like, you know, long history. Of, uh, of the house, but I think Diana has more uh, to tell. Uh, well, I, I did. I did try to um, uh, to get uh, some information, but actually, like you, I couldn't get. I couldn't get very far back. I could only get um, back about several generations. The, the people who sold me the house were four brothers who had um, inherited it from their father, and of course, the complicated um, Islamic inheritance rules mean that they all had to um, divide. You know, all had to get their share, and then there was the so-called dead auntie, who who owned you know two hundredths of the house, and <laughs> but she had since died, and you know all her heirs had to have a section. So legally, these things become immensely complicated, and I was warned, you know, don't don't go anywhere near a house that has more than four owners, <laughs> because you'll be stuck in the legal battles forever. <laughs> Having said that, legal battles seem to be a thing of, of Damascus. I mean, I've still got. Uh, four court cases going against me in, in Damascus as we speak, actually, but uh, my new lawyer is fighting them and is doing very well, actually. I, I think two of them we may have won already. <laughs> okay. People saying that they want, the house is not yours or wanting a stake? No, no, it's the same. Uh, it's the same lawyer. He hasn't given up. You know, he's, oh. he still thinks that he can find a way to get back. <laughs> yeah, back in the house. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. I have, we have a question from... Um, from uh, Roxana Komen, who's, who's asking about the ceilings in particular, especially this is inspired by Zahid's reconstruction um, on the craftsmanship. Yeah. Oh, are they Ottoman? Um, what's their origin? Do you know any more about the, the sort of detail that, of this yeah, particular? Uh, I, I read her questions, very interesting yeah. one. Well, basically, uh, uh, the, the, the tradition of this kind of elaborate ceilings it goes back before the Ottomans. So if you go to uh, the Ayyubid Mamluk houses, uh, not much of them left in, in Aleppo, but if you go to Cairo, which is as pre the, pre previous to the Ottoman rules, you see uh, a, a lot of those uh, ceilings. So then the, the Ottomans took that tradition and they changed it. It's, it's evolved crafts, it's uh, like everything else. So you add, in, in Syria was in particular, they added, they, they collaborated the Ajami tradition, which is, Ajami means Persian, so came from Persia, it's applying geo and gilding and coloring, whereas the Mamluk, they had only ornamental, more of the Mukarnas and the wood carving uh, uh, techniques, they were inserted yeah. as ceilings. So it is a pre-Ottomans, that's what I want to say. And Diana, you also had some magnificent ceilings as well that you were showing. You said one was hidden. Had it been covered? Yes. No, 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 no. I mean, it was hidden um, to the extent that the previous owner didn't even know it was there because it was in a derelict part of the house and it was covered in cobwebs and tucked away behind um, a whole sort of storage area. So yes, obviously, as part of the restoration, we exposed it. I actually turned it into my study. <laughs> so I had a rather magnificent ceiling above my study. And uh, uh, 
I mean, the thing is that all these different um, periods, so as, as, as I was explaining, you know, each, each side of the house is from a different century. So my house, you know, the earliest part is from 1610, and then there's the Ajami is from 1700s, and then uh, the secret ceiling is 19th century. Um, and, and so each, each bit of the house, um, you know, has its own character and, and represents a different, an entirely different world. Almost, so you you feel you're transiting within this multi-layered capsule as you as you walk around. Yes, um, we have a question um, about uh, a personal question uh, for uh, Zahed about uh, how and when did you take uh, your parents out? Um, we have a, a question here that you can probably see about. Um, how how did your parents live? How did they survive? Yes. Yeah, I did not see that uh, question, uh -huh. but anyway, I can answer it. Yes. Uh, I went there in 2015 to get them out. They refused. I forced my father to issue a passport. And then he, he was like, like, you know, agreeing with me. When we got to the point that it's serious and now we, I can like, you know, I want to take you out. He was crying like a child really. He said, I don't want to go. I want, I, born, I was born here and I want to die here. You know, I survived all, everything and I will survive. And he's still alive. He is still, I mean, he's a broken man to see his beautiful city in, in, in pieces. But he's still there. He's in his 80s. My mother that was very fragile, somehow she became very strong. She's older than him. She's four or five years older than him. And she's now taking care of him. They are happily uh, living there. Of course, I have to take care of them because the conditions are really, really bad. There is no proper supply of basic life. Uh, uh, I don't know, electricity, water, warlords controlling Syria now, and you have to buy everything in order to have a decent minimum uh, uh, yeah, life. So they are there and they are okay. okay. Okay, Even in the Corona, yeah. and they, um, um, I'm blessed and I'm keep visiting them. If it wasn't the Corona, I would be there. Okay. And uh, a question also for Diane about how did you, how do you contact your na your neighbours in such a time? Um, well, I mean, the technology is brilliant there. I've got better broadband connection in that house than I have in this <laughs> country, believe it or not. And. Uh, they're all on WhatsApp. I mean, you know, it's actually incredibly easy. Skype, WhatsApp. I mean, it's very, very easy to be in touch. So um, there's no, absolutely no communication problem. Um, the 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 lack of electricity, obviously, um, is, is is can be an issue. So so you know, but you, they you tend to know by and large when you've got the power. There are, there are sort of different cycles for different parts of the city. So you know that your electricity is coming back at six o'clock, for instance. So you you schedule everything. For, for, for that period where you know you've got access to. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, another question about Aleppo uh, for Zahid. Um, you, you spoke a little bit about how people moved into their nice modern flats and, and sort of and sold or their, their houses or did they sell them um, when they moved to the suburbs uh, or did they remain the owners um, sort of renting them to schools and other establishments do you know yeah 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 no this is a major major issue in 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 aleppo in all the old cities in damascus i mean uh, um diana on that so you when i was looking for a house you have a house with deed that contain 90 holders on on them 90 names so they inheritance people inherit from their grandfather so they, they rarely sold them uh, or they rent them so you have like, you know, the school, they rent it to the, to the government to have it as a school for really nothing. And uh, so it's, it's a major problem because uh, people want to buy and restore and do uh, work with those houses. They face this bureaucratic impossible mission to establish ownership and then buy them. So you can get lease sometime. It's very complicated issue and, and a major problem in uh, the conservation of uh, Aleppo and Damascus and all the old cities in Syria, in Syria. And we just had a question that's come in to ask um, if you're going to be writing a book about your house. <laughs> the story. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I wish I have, if you can give me more time, I'm, uh, I, uh, if, if, if the genie comes out of uh, the lamp and ask me for something, I would ask for time. Then I can write another book. I think we... <laughs> I think we can all write um, Yes, hopefully, hopefully, maybe one day. Yes, uh, yes uh, another question. Um, a sort of some, uh, we have uh, someone I think who must be writing from Morocco, Elizabeth, uh, excuse me, I'm going to say this incorrectly, <laughs> Degenstein. Um, that structure of the houses in Syria reminds me a lot of the Riyads in Morocco. Is there a historic connection? Is this a house structure that represents the Arab world more broadly? Uh, I can answer that maybe. Uh, Diana can add to that. Uh, the tradition it's evolved over millennia. So uh, if you if you trace the Mesopotamian way of building and how houses constructed over courtyard, and then into the Roman time, uh, you see uh, very clearly the way that uh, the Romans started that courtyard uh, idea, and the Arabs, of course, they adapted that style, and because of their religion tradition, they it's evolved mm -hmm. and you see it the same in uh, in, in Syria in, in the major like you know cities like you know Cairo uh, in Tunisia and the Riyadh model the, the difference will be in kind of like details but as a principle it is the same okay yeah. uh, I should say Elizabeth has said that she's uh, <laughs> that she's in London <laughs> but she's noticed this uh, similarity between uh, across the Arab world as you're saying we have Alessandro Colombo, um, who lived in Damascus in uh, 2010, and he has a question for both of you. If you have read, read Marwa al Sabuni's study of urban planning and war in Syria, and what are your thoughts on it? Quickly. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, I, I know Marwa. Um, you know, she's, she's a friend of mine, and I think her book is, is brilliant. Um, uh, it's, it's absolutely the kind of sort of organic growth and you know the, the sort of vision for future housing for, for Syria it would be so wonderful if her some of her ideas could be uh, could be used but of course the, the Assad regime has not the slightest interest in using any of her ideas it wants to build Dubai style skyscrapers you know people call it the haunts uh, you know the sort of the, the nightmare you know they call it the dream and uh, the, the actual residents call it the nightmare but uh, so yes, I mean, her, her, her ideas are terrific, I think, and her book is wonderful. Uh, and if only somebody and people like her had some power, but sadly, they can write a book, but they've got no power. So skyscrapers, as long as Assad is there, is what it's gonna be. Okay. And we have Annie Evans, uh, a question again for both speakers. Uh, Maybe this is a, a good one to sort of just summarize with. What do you think the future holds, both for your own houses, but also others like them across Syria? Um, uh, I mean, as I said, and I like to see it, those houses are much older than us. They've seen many people in and out, and they will carry on doing that. At the moment, the situation is not good and uh, the what happens in syria we don't need to go into details but there is no future uh, that is good seems to be at the moment it's all the efforts are on personal level so people like me that they can afford people now struggling for bread yet building a, a house or restoring things i mean i know from my neighborhoods people have nothing you know they hardly can survive to rebuild their houses so unless there is a major intervention and money to uh, inject it in the system and to restore and build the houses you know remember this is both sites it's unesco uh, heritage sites so this is an international duty they've seen the cities the sites being destroyed they were silent and now they are again uh, going to intervene. It's it's not our history, it's the world history. And God knows what happens. 
Yes, well, I, I couldn't agree more. It, it should be it should be an international responsibility, but of course, um, you know, the, the West has abdicated all responsibility and has sat on the sidelines and watched. Basically, you know, never has a war been so documented as the Syrian war. But to what end? To what end? Everybody just watched uh, and watched the destruction. You know, as 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 uh, you know, as half the population lost their homes and a third of the population is displaced externally and you know refugees across across Europe uh, you know on a scale that has um, destabilized the whole of Europe you know it, it's uh, the the consequences I mean it's a very short-sighted um, inability to, to grip the situation but um, I, I'm a natural optimist and I do believe that um, underneath uh, you know, actually, I had this conversation, funnily enough, with Marwa, Marwa Sabuni. I, I said to her, look, at the moment, the way I see it, the scum is sitting on top in, in, uh, in Syria. But the question is, you know, scum always rises to the top in war. But what proportion of, uh, when you look at the glass, how much, how much scum would you say there is? You know, is, is it like 10% or is it, you know, 90%? And, and, and we both... Uh, agreed actually that the layer of scum on top is really quite small <laughs> 10 percent you know was roughly what we were guessing underneath that 10 percent of scum you've got you know really decent honest people who are just struggling to get out and and you know i just think it's it should be an international duty frankly for, for people you know people who have the power and who can make policy decisions to uh you know to to, to not to let this kind of total tyranny and destruction of his own, uh, not only his own people, his own cultural heritage, everything, you know, they're just allowing him to get away with it. So what message does that send to future dictators? You can kill your people, you can destroy everything and you'll get away with it. And then we're going to cooperate with you. Well, clearly, you know, that, that, that's, that is not the route to go down because you're just sanctioning all future such behavior. So, uh, you know, I would urge people to, 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 you know, to stand up for, um, you know, for, for the international community to be more actively, proactively, you know, a, a force for good and change in Syria. Thank you. I think those are perfect <laughs> words to end on. And thank you both very much for telling the story, intimate stories of your um, your homes uh, in Syria. And, uh, and it's sad, but we, we must hope for the future and we must remember, as you say, that uh, these houses uh, have, have been around for a very long time and, and, and will continue. And will continue. Um, so I, I hope that uh, it went, we'll be able to go back in the not too distant future. Yes, and maybe uh, be able yeah. to visit us in our respective houses one day. Yeah. <laughs> it's just two hours away from <laughs> where I am now. Also, as you can see, the sun is setting here, so we're heading towards uh, its heart. Mm. So I would like to um, thank everybody for um, joining us today and staying and staying with us. Um, for our, our wonderful speakers and the wonderful pictures and memories of uh, Syria. Um, I hope that uh, those who've been with us have uh, enjoyed the event as much as I have. Um, and. Um, just again, to put my uh, CBRL hat on, uh, please do look at our website uh, for future events. Uh, we'd love it if you join us, um, and sign up for them, join us on Zoom, or, uh, or, if, or um, usually they're live streamed as well. Um, so we have lectures that are coming up on everything from mandate history to COVID. Um, visit our website uh, at cbrl.ac.uk. Um, Facebook and we have Twitter as well. Join our, join our mailing list and you can even support us by becoming a member too. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much again to our speakers. Uh, so everyone have a good evening and uh, Masalama from Aman. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.